For winter sports aficionados, it sounds like a dream. A near untouched luxury ski resort nestled in the mountains of an exotic nation. A resort characterized by virgin snow, 11 multi-level ski runs, ice rinks, saunas, and an exclusive hotel with rooms for just a fraction of what you'd spend in Aspen or in the Alps. Sounds enticing? Well, there's a little catch. This dream destination isn't in some emerging nation or even in an adversary like China. No, it's in North Korea, a country with a human rights record that might charitably be called appalling. Nor is it just some random getaway cut off from the currents of the outside world. Rather, Masik Kryong is central to Kim Jong-un's plan to make the DPRK great again. First conceived back in 2013, Masik Kryong was intended to open North Korea up to the international jet set, boosting the economy and supercharging investment. Part of a greater project known as the Wonsan Special Tourist Zone, it should have been the first step in turning the Hermit Kingdom into an economic tiger. Instead, it now stands as a haunting monument to hubris, a glamorous tombstone topping a dead dream. When Kim Jong-un first came to power in North Korea in 2012, foreign media was transfixed by both his age and his sheer bloodthirstiness. Over the following years, the tubby tyrants launched a series of brutal purges that included killing his own uncle. He had his half-brother assassinated with a nerve agent at an airport in Malaysia. To top it off, he also oversaw four separate nuclear tests, twice as many as his father had achieved. And that's before he got into a sagging match with the President of the United States. So he'd be forgiven for remembering Kim's first years in office as nothing but a non-stop horror show. A carnival of cruelty and saber-rattling. But for observers of the Hermit Kingdom, there was also something else that typified the 2010s, something as unlike the executions and warmongering rhetoric as it is possible to get. These, you see, were the years when Kim tried to turn North Korea into a tourist destination. On the face of it, this seems as ridiculous as custard underpants. Leave aside the fact that no tourist in their right mind would spend money propping up a genocide or dictatorship, uh, what would even the North Koreans get out of this? But dig a little deeper and a twisted kind of logic starts to become visible. At the time Kim announced his plans, the DPRK was, and still is, under strict sanctions. Normal ways to make money, like exporting textiles or selling coal and iron, were illegal. Yet the UN sanctions didn't forbid foreigners from traveling to North Korea, nor did they forbid the North Koreans from making money off of them. In short, tourism was one of the few legitimate means that Kim had left to earn hard currency, something his impoverished state desperately needed. When he took over from his dad in 2012, one of Kim's first promises was that his people would never have to tighten their belts again. That meant economic development. That meant attracting foreign investment, even as the human rights abuses continued. Not that it was only about money, though. Despite looking like his weekly exercise regimen stops at waving his hand for more cheese, Kim Jong-un is said to be a passionate believer in physical competition. Across his tenure, Pyongyang has seen an explosion of sports halls, skating rinks, outdoor gyms, and basketball courts. Getting his subjects playing sport together, in Kim's view, means more social cohesion. Hence the plan that Dictator unveiled in early 2013. The one that would combine his love of sport with his love of foreign money. The plan to build a glamorous ski resort known as Masik Kryong. Located in the mountains overlooking the country's eastern coast, Masik Kryong would be a North Korean destination unlike any other. One with world-class facilities, capable of hosting 5,000 tourists in a day. Since officials at the time estimated only 5,500 North Koreans even knew how to ski from a total population of 25 million, this necessarily meant attracting foreigners. Lots and lots of foreigners. One method for achieving this was offering Masik Kryong as a venue for the 2018 Winter Olympics, scheduled to be held in South Korea. The idea presumably being that Joe American would see the place on TV and think, oh boy howdy, that socialist paradise looks perfect for my next vacation. I apologize. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Seoul turned down Kim's offer, yet 
this didn't put the tyrant off of his little pet project. Following the if you build it, they will come logic of Field of Dreams, Kim decided that he wouldn't just stop with a single ski resort. Oh, no, no, no. Rather than a standalone destination, Massacreong would soon be part of the greatest tourist region in the world. At the time that he began pushing for the creation of Massa Kriong, Kim was also ordering work to begin on other special tourist zones. Sam Yeon was another ski resort, one less glamorous than Massa Kriong, but located right up in the north where Chinese visitors could easily access it. Mount Kumgang tourist area, meanwhile, was right down in the south, perfect for day trippers from Seoul. But the jewel in the tourism crown wouldn't be up in the mountains, rather it would be based around a strip of golden sand on the coast a few kilometers east of Masakryong, adjacent to a city known as Wonsan. It was here that the hub of the Wonsan Special Tourist Zone would be built. Officially announced in 2014, the zone actually began life the year before, when Kim suddenly ordered the reconstruction of Wonsan Airport to accommodate 1.2 million flyers annually. Given the Wonsan at this time was a grimy industrial city with a population of just 350,000 people, it was obvious the dear leader was up to something. But it was only 12 months later that the scope of his plans became clear. From a car manufacturing hub, Wonsan was to be transformed into a resort town, one focused around spas, swimming pools, and beach activities. More than that, it was to become the center of a gigantic tourist area spreading over 400 square kilometers, from Masakyong up in the mountains to the great waterfall at Ilim. In this year-round wonderland, foreign tourists would enjoy everything from long walks by the sea to hikes in the forests to skiing in the winter. Imagine Aspen combined with Miami Beach and then sprinkled with Soviet-era surveillance and filled with images of Kim Jong-un beaming down at you. That bizarre concoction is what the Wonsan Special Tourist Zone was meant to be. Yet, yeah, just because it was undoubtedly a strange idea doesn't mean Kim was crazy to try and push it. Throughout the long march of the 2010s, through the nuclear tests, political crises, and a near war with the United States, tourism to the DPRK continued to steadily grow. Even at the height of the 2017 to 2018 crisis, when it looks like conflict might be imminent, Pyongyang welcomed hundreds of thousands of foreigners. The source of most of these dark tourists? China. Although Kim conceived of Nasa Kriong and Wonsan as a place elites from Japan, Europe, and the Middle East would flock to, the backbone of his plan was the mass of Chinese visitors who were already visiting his nation each year. In 2019 alone, a bare minimum of 350,000 Chinese vacationed in North Korea, with some estimates putting the total at over a million. And this uh, was before most of the tourist zones were even finished. Aside from Nasa Kriong, those Chinese citizens were stuck pootling around places like Pyongyang. Perhaps it's no wonder Kim began the second decade of the 21st century feeling confident in his tourist vision. But of course, uh, we all know what happened next. In early January 2020, news started leaking out of China of a virulent form of pneumonia linked to the city of Wuhan. On the 21st of that month, when COVID had officially only killed nine people, Kim Jong-un ordered his nation's borders slammed shut. The tourist revenues vanished as the world plunged into lockdown. Fast forward to the time of recording in March of 2023, and the DPRK still isn't accepting foreigners back. Now, before we get into the impact of COVID, though, uh, we first need to turn back the clock a little bit. Back to 2014. Back to the grand opening of Kim's Winter Wonderland. In terms of strange parties, it's hard to imagine one stranger than the party that took place 175 kilometers east of Pyongyang on the 1st of January 2014. Set against a spectacular mountain backdrop under a blanket of fresh snow, the party wasn't just strange because of who attended, although the sight of an intoxicated Dennis Rodman zooming around on a snowmobile and hollering uh, would have certainly been odd. Nor is it weird because of the skiing display put on by Kim Jong-un, who, as a band played and women cheered, he zipped up and down the mountains with surprising nimbleness, for once not a propaganda trick, but a reminder that the tyrant spent his formative years at an expensive school in the Swiss Alps with talented ski instructors on hand. No, uh, what must have been weirdest about Massa Kriong's opening party uh, was the juxtaposition of this drunken glamour with the world that surrounded it. Just over the horizon, for example, lay Kyowaso No. 8, a prison camp, part of the DPRK's vast gulag, where 3,000 detainees lived in conditions of unbearable misery. Between it and Pyongyang back west, a stretch of typical North Korean countryside unfurled, a place of shacks, 
malnutrition, starvation, disease, running for miles and miles. Yet up here, on this mountaintop, guests could have almost imagined the entire world was trouble-free, that everyone was able to drink champagne and nibble on canapes as easily as they were. And that, presumably, is exactly how Kim wanted it. Now, there aren't many descriptions of Masikyong out there, as only a handful of Westerners have ever visited, only a fraction of whom then went on to write about it. But from the accounts we read, it seems really like it was a place of luxury. People speak of sparkling tiles and beautiful woodwork in the hotels designed for foreigners, of flat-screen TVs and comfy linen and other things that you wouldn't really associate with the DPRK. The official tourist board, likewise, paints a picture of luxury. Hotel One, the hotel hotel for non-Koreans is said to have 120 rooms with communal spaces turned over to things like saunas, swimming pools, cafes, and restaurants. There's even a karaoke bar. For anyone used to alpine resorts, this probably doesn't sound that special. But then, just remember, this is a country where most citizens outside of Pyongyang don't even have electricity. Well, then it becomes so much more surreal. The ski facilities, too, are likewise at an international level, with the 11 north-facing slopes ranging from two beginner runs to a hardcore piece dangled at almost 40 degrees. Admittedly, only five of these had been opened by the time COVID hit, but you can't really deny that Kim was thinking big, and that's not even including the ice rinks. Perhaps most amazingly of all, though, is that everything was built at warp speed. From start to finish, construction at Masikyong is said to have taken only 10 months. So pleased by this were Pyongyang's propagandists that new slogans were forged urging workers in other sectors to complete their tasks at Masikryong speed. Yet for all the resorters impressed most outsiders who venture there, there are still signs that this is not a normal vacation spot. One particularly notable one is the propaganda screens at the bottom of the slopes. Automatically switched on, they blast out a steady stream of anti-Western and pro-Kim slogans loud enough for everybody to hear. Another is the evidence of corners cut to avoid falling foul of sanctions. Take the six ski lifts designed to ferry visitors to the top of the peaks. When Outside Magazine visited back in 2014, they reported described them as slow and rickety and prone to shuddering as if they might collapse at any moment. And that's because Kim had originally contracted a Swiss company to provide state-of-the-art lifts and cable cars for $7.7 million, but UN sanctions blocked the deal, leading North Korea to memorably accuse the body of a serious human rights abuse. Still, sanctions or no sanctions, Masikryong has been running for almost a decade now without any major incident. Even during the depths of the pandemic, satellite imagery detected artificial snow being spread onto the slope, suggesting Pyongyang elites were still visiting. Nearby, too, more construction work seems to be underway. The North Korean monitoring group 38 North reported in early 2023 that new ski chalets were being built and speculated that this meant foreign tourists would soon be returning. If they do come back, though, the vacationers might be in for a disappointment. Because while Masakryong does indeed seem to be open, the rest of Kim's planned resorts all conversely seem to be in various stages of catastrophic failure. If Masakryong was to be the glamorous jet-setting diamond in Kim Jong-un's crown, then Won Sankarma Beach was to be its mass market counterpart, a dazzling seaside utopia that would see up to 100,000 guests at any given time. Announced in 2014, with construction starting four years later, this slice of North Korean coast was intended to be the first thing foreign arrivals saw of the special tourist zone, a place to unwind and relax after a long flight. Stretching along five kilometers of shore, Won Sankarma is a place of densely packed hotels, the sort of vista of high-rises that you might see on Spain's southern coast. There are stadiums and international conference centers, outdoor Olympic-sized pools for either lane swimming or diving, a large water park for younger visitors. Along the front, a meandering promenade appeared, dotted with gardens, benches, and bike paths. Floating piers were set up, as was a vast marina for luxury yachts. There was to be a tram system, a path for riding electric scooters, cinemas, and entertainment venues dotted alongside restaurants and food stalls. And beside it all, the natural attraction meant to draw people from far and wide. The gleaming North Korean sand overlooked by dozens of pastel-hued hotels. So, what happened? How come the second part of Kim's tourist dream didn't come to pass? To guess, well, all you need to do is look at the projected opening date. April 2020. Yep, the Wonsan Beach Resort seems to have been yet another victim of COVID and North Korea's closed borders. As of March 2023, it's still unfinished, a spooky wonderland where everything was built but nobody came, a place of towering hotels without windows or guests, pools without water, a promenade 
untouched by human feet. Unlike Massacreon, construction also seems to have ground to a halt, meaning that it's possible that this pleasure city will now stand empty for all time, a desolate, windswept monument to a place that never was. And it's a similar story in the northern mountains at Samyon. Intended to be the other great ski resort, Samyon began its transformation from mountain town to glitzy destination back in 2013 under Kim Jong-un's watchful eye. There was no Massacreong speed here, though. Creating the ski slopes, fancy hotels, and luxury spas took time. Six years in all, only finally opening in December 2019. At the time, Kim called it the epitome of modern civilization, but within mere days of its inauguration, Samyon Resort had likewise been closed due to COVID. Today, it remains unfinished. The story goes like that across all of Kim's tourist zones. Once the cradle of North Korea's hopes and dreams for an economic miracle, they now stand mostly abandoned, looking less like destinations and more like the set for some post-apocalyptic film. The saddest part? There's no reason to think that the end of the pandemic will change this. While North Korea is expected to reopen to tourism in 2023, it's doing so at a time when it may be physically incapable of supporting foreign visitors. Monitoring site 38 North announced in January that the DPRK was facing its worst food crisis since the famine of the 1990s. In their words, to quote, food availability has likely fallen below the bare minimum with regard to human needs. This has been reflected in official statements too, with Kim recently halting talk of economic expansion and ordering officials to focus on agricultural production, a tall order given the devastated nature of the nation's farmland. Facing an impending subsistence disaster, what sort of mad country would focus more on keeping tourists happy than its people fed? More to the point, what sort of tourists would be happy to relax on a beach knowing there were people starving just a few hundred meters away? The tale of North Korea's luxury resorts may be fascinating and comic, but we also shouldn't forget that they're also symbols of tragedy. The tragedy of how a dictator who cares nothing for his people can waste millions of dollars on trinkets that will never be used.